Well, good morning again, and the first and foremost, happy Father's Day um, to all the fathers out there, and I'm glad that we get to celebrate with you this morning. I was joking with Jesse that uh, I, w- I could either grill brats or we can get all the dads a set of grill tongs, you know, let you guys do the work. Um, no, but... Uh, uh, I, in all seriousness, I'm so glad that you guys could be here and we could celebrate with you all. Um, and today we'll be looking at Psalm 57. Psalm 57. This summer we've been going through the book of Psalms, and especially this summer we're looking um, to abide in prayer. And we're doing that in a couple ways. But uh, the book of Psalms is very near and dear to my heart in high school. Um, The Lord did a number on me, and he drove me during that time to find comfort within the book of Psalms. Reading and memorizing a psalm a day, my heart took to the book of Psalms like a kid to candy. Why, though? Why? Well, because the book of Psalms is personal. It is a personal book. Whenever one goes through a hard time in this life, they usually turn to the book of Psalms. Psalm 23 is a huge psalm that people always turn to when they're going through hardship. You know that psalm, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He leads me beside still waters. He leads me into greener pastures. You know that psalm. People turn to the book of Psalms to find comfort because it's personal. When a crisis happens, people turn to this book. It connects with us. A lot of the psalmists turn lament to praise, hardship to exaltation, darkness to delight. They are personal because David and the different psalmists have their heart open, their heart open and are personally seeking after God, whether in prayer or in a song. And we get to turn to this book, no matter where we're at in this life, we can open it and attach ourselves to where the psalmists are and feel what they feel and how they are personally exalting the one who is rightfully deserving to be exalted. I love this book, and I'm excited that we get to open up Psalm 57 together today. Uh, but before I get ahead of myself, let's pray. Lord, we come before you. I pray, Lord, that you would speak through me, that you would draw hearts to repentance, to exalt you above every other thing in their life. I pray, Lord, that you would be exalted in this service. This this is not for us. We are not just placeholders, Lord, but we come together as one body to serve the one and holy true God, and that is you. I pray, Father, that you would do a number here today for your glory and your glory alone. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, if you have your Bibles open, go ahead and turn to Psalm 57. We're going to be looking at verse 1 through 11, which reads, this. Be merciful to me, O God. Be merciful to me. For in you my soul takes refuge. In the shadow of your wings I will take refuge. To the storms of destruction pass by. I cry out to the God most high, to God who fulfills his purpose for me. He will send from heaven and save me. He will put to shame him who tramples on me. God will send out his steadfast love and his faithfulness. My soul is in the midst of lions. I lie down amid fiery beasts and the children of man whose teeth are spears and arrows, whose tongues are sharper than swords. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens and let your glory be over all the earth. They set a net for my steps. My soul was bowed down. They dug a pit in my way, but they have fallen into it themselves. My heart is steadfast, O God. My heart is steadfast. I will sing and make melody. Awake my glory. Awake, O harp and lyre. I will awake the dawn. I will give thanks to you, O Lord, among the peoples. I will sing praises to you among the nations. For your steadfast love is great to the heavens and your faithfulness to the clouds. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens, and let your glory be over all the earth. This is the word of God that is divinely inspired. And the one thing that I want you to walk away with this morning, the one thing that I want you to take out into the world is this. If you have a pen and a piece of paper, you need to write this down because this is the big idea. Exalt God within the crisis. 
exalt God within the crisis. Well, how should I exalt God within the crisis? By remembering that point number one, he is your refuge and savior. Exalt God within the crisis by remembering that he is your refuge and savior. Look at verse one. It says, be merciful to me, O God, be merciful to me. For in you my soul takes refuge. In the shadow of your wings I will take refuge. Till the storms of destruction pass by. I cry out to God most high, to God who fulfills his purpose for me. He will send from heaven and save me. He will put to shame him who tramples on me. God will send out his steadfast love and faithfulness. And an almost identical desperate cry for God's grace in chapter um, 56. If you weren't here last week, I highly encourage you to go back and listen to Jesse's sermon last week. I listened to it online. It was great. But it is almost identical, David's cry for God's mercy to be upon him. And at this point in David's life, Jesse talked about a little bit um, last week on where David's at. But David is literally on the run for his life. He is literally on the run for his life from King Saul, who was fixated on David's immediate death. David posed a threat to Saul's power and glory as king of Israel, which wasn't really even his in the first place. It was the Lord's. As David was God's chosen king over Israel. The psalm is calculated by uh, some to be a song while David is in the midst of, of, of a cave in 1 Samuel chapter 24. I highly, again, encourage you to go back and look at that chapter. I love it. It is uh, 1 Samuel chapter 24 where David actually spares Saul life. And it's calculated by some that this is, this is the psalm that David sung within that cave. David is literally running for his life. And within this cave, he finds refuge physically. But he sees beyond that refuge of the cave. He acknowledges that his only refuge within this crisis is God himself. You can just sit back and imagine David who's on the run for his life in this cave just looking out into the darkness or into the daylight and just knowing that God is his refuge. That this, his refuge goes beyond this cave that he's in. His refuge is within God himself. He says in verse 1, for, you, for in you, in you, God, my soul takes refuge. In the shadow of your wings, I will take refuge. Repetition is important. Till the storms of destruction pass by. You see, David sees the storm. He acknowledges that the sin is real within his situation. What is happening to him is wrong. It's not a fun thing to run for your life. I've never run for my life before, but I can't imagine that it's a happy moment, a happy situation to be in. And instead of complaining about where David is in his situation, he goes right to God himself. He goes right to the one who he can hide in spiritually. David saw past ever-present danger and acknowledged that he serves the God most high. The God who is higher than he is. The God who is stronger than he is. The God who is higher than even his situation. The God who was and is and will always will be that God. He goes to the God most high. He cries out to that God. The same one who gave his son to die in your and I's place. In order that we may too have eternal refuge in him. I love verse 2. It says, I cry out to God most high, to the God who fulfills his purpose for me. If you, look, if you look in detail, there's three words there that are capitalized. God most high. That's important. That's for, that, you guys should circle that within your Bible. Highlight that. God is most high. And David turns to that God for refuge and salvation 
that God who fulfills every purpose for David. And if you look at verse 3, David continues to impress his heart into the character of God, acknowledging that God will save him. That he is his savior and love, that loves and is faithful. Look at verse 3. He says, he will send from heaven and save me. He will put to shame him who tramples on me. God will send out his steadfast love and faithfulness. Do you see a theme? He will, he will, God will. David has an ever-present hope that God will save him, not only from this crisis, but eternally. And you know what? We live on the, the other part of the cross, where God has, where he has. He has saved David. He has sent from heaven and saved. He has put to shame them or him who tramples on him. God has sent his steadfast love and has been faithful by sending the person of Jesus Christ, his only son. Exalt God within the crisis by remembering that he is your refuge and savior. When I was thinking on how to really illustrate this um, while I was preparing this sermon, we, have a, we moved into a new apartment a couple months ago, Bella and I, and we have a little patio set that's covered by trees. And in this one tree to the, to the right, when I'm sitting in my chair, it's to the right, has a little dove's nest in it. And there's a whole bunch of little baby doves in there, and um, the mommy dove, I'm just going to call it mommy dove and daddy dove, okay? The mommy dove and daddy dove, you know, watch over this nest. And, and in Wisconsin, in the spring, it usually storms. We've had some crazy storms this spring. And, you know, I would, I would sit, you know, in the house and look, and I'd be like, how is that dove nest still there? How are those babies still alive after the crazy storms that we've had? The babies are hidden within the effects of the storm from the mother. They're hidden within her wings. And I was thinking the storms don't stop just because there's babies there. Now the storms still come. They still blow. There's still lightning and thunder. But you know what? Those babies are hidden within the protection of their mom. Their mother is their only refuge, their only salvation. They are totally dependent upon her for, for protection in the midst of the crisis. The church is no different with us and Jesus. It's no different. We need to rest in the total dependence in our refuge and Savior, Jesus Christ, as our eternal refuge and our eternal Savior from the righteous judgment of our sin. Church, we need to exalt God within the crisis the same way David does by acknowledging that we are in need, that we cannot save ourselves. I'm not talking about just an ever-present crisis. I'm talking about an eternal crisis that your sin has caused. That we cannot get to salvation on our own that we need to cry out to the most high God. And know that he will fulfill his purpose for us. He will. No matter what crisis we are in, you know what you are going through, what you're struggling with. You may not even be going through something right now, but you will. There will be a storm. It will come. And what that crisis should do is point you back to the Lord to acknowledge the real crisis at hand is that your relationship with him is broken and that you are in need of a refuge and savior. He is the only place you should go and he is the only one that will save you. There is a refuge for, and salvation for you. Are you gonna take it? And if you have, great, praise the Lord, exalt him. Because God's steadfast love and faithfulness David was looking at was seen perfectly within the person of Jesus Christ. You want that God to be your refuge. 
You want that God to be your savior. So start by exalting the work done for you on the cross. You want to learn how to exalt God within the crisis? Go right to the cross. That's a perfect place to start. Take refuge in that because it's the same thing David did because he knew it was God alone. God alone died for you and me to be that refuge and savior. And all you have to do is confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord and you shall be saved. <clears throat> and from there, you can exalt God into his rightful place that in all seasons, all seasons, you can cry just as David did in verse 5, God be exalted above the heavens and let your glory be above the earth. I'm not saying that in every season you have to be, oh boy, this is great, this is awesome, okay? Whatever is happening in my life is absolutely fantastic. No, that's not what I'm saying, okay? But what I'm saying is that no matter what you go through, you can always turn to God and praise him because he does and is fulfilling his purpose for you and he has you in his hand. So exalt God within the crisis by remembering he is your refuge and savior, point number one. But point number two, exalt, uh, exalt God within the crisis by remembering that he is deserving and just. Look at verse four through six. It says this. My soul is in the midst of lions. I lie down amid fiery beasts and the children of man whose teeth are spears and arrows, whose tongues are sharper than swords. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. And they set a net for my steps. My soul was bowed down. They dug a pit in my way, but they have fallen into it themselves. You see, David continues his lament upon the situation he's in in greater detail, describing the hunt for his life and that his soul is literally trapped by lions. It's in the midst of lions. And that the children of man whose teeth are sharper than spears and arrows. David is literally saying here, look, these people want to kill me. This is a real threat. I'm not just, you know, lollygagging through lavender fields. No, I'm running for my life because they want to kill me. This is real. This is an ever-present danger. I'm running for my life. And you see, David is using imagery to display how awful his crisis is. But his response is not complaining. His response in verse 5, which is crazy, it blows my mind. His response from running for his life is this. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. You wouldn't think that a, that would be the response of somebody who's running for their life. But it's the right. It's the right one. Church. David immediately goes from hopelessness to hope, reminding his heart within desperation that God is bigger than his situation. He is above the heavens, and that is where he deserves to be. That his glory is over all the earth. And man, I don't know about you guys, but that fires me up. That fires me up. Like that, the verse five, be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be above the earth. That should be a battle cry for our heart's desperation within a crisis. Within hurting, within pain, within affliction, our heart should automatically go back to God and say, Lord, you are above this. That you are higher than this. That you are greater than this. And that you're greater than I. David says in verse six that they have set a net for my steps my soul was bowed down. They dug a pit in my way, but they have fallen into it themselves. Themselves. David's enemy's destruction will come by their own sin at the justification of the Lord. You know, this seems kind of like one of those phrases, like what, you know, people say like what goes around comes around type of things, you know. And David's like, what goes around comes around, but not at the hand of karma, not at the hand of luck, but by the hand of God. Sin will be judged. Christ is coming back to judge the living and the dead. It's going to happen. 
And it's not anybody else's fault but ours. It's not somebody else's sin or what somebody else did to me or whatever. It is, I dug the pit, I fell into it. And our only refuge from that pit is Christ. Because he is above the heavens. He is above the heavens. He is higher, better, greater than even the stars. You know, when I, again, when I was thinking about this, above the heavens, um, we have this farm in northern Missouri where it's an Amish country, and there is basically no light pollution here. Now, I can see a couple stars from my patio, and there, but there's still lights. But I have, y'all, I have never seen as many stars as I have at that farm. It blows my mind to look up above the heavens and see the countless stars that display God's glory. And all I can do is stand there and say, wow. Have you ever, guys ever had one of those moments where you're either standing over a beach? You know, Sally, I mean, I know Anna Maria. You're standing over the beach, okay, you're looking at a sunset going down. You're like, God alone only created that. There's nothing else that could create that. There has to be a creator. And it's like one of those jaw-dropping moments where you just stand in awe and you're like, wow. I can imagine David just standing there outside the cave looking up at the heavens and above the stars and knowing that God is the one who created those, that he is higher than those. He is higher than that. And that is his glory that is on display. It blows my mind. He is deserving and just. We serve a God church who deserves to be exalted. He deserves it. Who deserves to sit high over our life and to reign and to bring justice to those who have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Our response should be as David's is, is to look at our crisis and to see the great sin of it and to right away turn back to the character of God and acknowledge who he is and where he always, always needs to be. Always needs to be. Because he is deserving and just over all things. Exalt God within the crisis by remembering he is your savior or he is your refuge and savior. Exalt God within the crisis by remembering that he is deserving and just. And point number three, exalt God within the crisis because he is faithful and his love is steadfast. Look at verse 7. It reads, my heart is steadfast, O God. My heart is steadfast. I will sing and make melody. Awake my glory. Awake, O harp and lyre. I will awake the dawn. I will give thanks to you, O Lord, among the peoples. I will sing praises to you among the nations. For your steadfast love is great to the heavens and your faithfulness to the clouds. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens and let your glory be over all the earth. Even in the midst of a chaotic crisis, David's whole being always turns back to center himself upon the character of God. And it's because of who God is that David turns to exalt him in praise. My heart is steadfast, O God. My heart is steadfast. I will sing and make melody, awake my glory. The word for my glory there is actually meaning David's whole self. It's not saying that like, oh, man, David's got some glory to give back to God. No, okay? That is everything in within David from his head down to his toes. With everything inside of him, he is placing himself below the God who deserves to be praised and he's acknowledging that he is faithful and his love is steadfast. Everything within himself is built to praise the Lord, is built to exalt him. Why does David's whole being exalt God within a crisis? It's like, dude, You don't have any situation in your life right now where you can turn back and praise God and exalt him for who he is. But David's like, oh, wait, I do. I do because he is. 
in a situation that doesn't promote it? David, what are you doing? How can you sing and make melody? How can you give thanks in a situation that doesn't promote it? It's because the Lord said fast and he's faithful. Look at verse 10. He says, for your steadfast love is great to the heavens and your faithfulness to the clouds. David puts a stamp on the way he can praise. After saying all this stuff from verse 7 through 9, he can stamp it. This is why I praise. This is why I sing. This is why I can be in an awful situation where people are hunting for my life and I can turn back and exalt God because he's worthy. It's hard to praise within crisis. I mean, if we're looking at ourselves, if we're being real with ourselves, we don't like to praise things when we're in a crisis. We just got back from a Branson trip with my family down in Missouri. And if you don't know where Branson is, it, it's in Missouri. It's where dreams come true. I'm telling you, you should take a trip there. It's great, okay? But we, uh, we go shoot. Uh, all the guys get together and we shoot sporting clays. If you don't know what sporting clays are, it's basically golf with guns, okay? We shoot shotguns, and there's, there's 50 clays that you're trying to hit as many as possible out of 50. And I'm, okay, I'm going to be brag a little bit. I like to shoot, okay? I'm usually a pretty good shot, but guys, y'all, I got whooped, okay? I got whooped. And I shot like, I think like 22 clays out of 50. It was terrible, okay? It was really bad. My uh, newly brother-in-law was there. He's never shot before, whooped my tail. Um, I, it was bad. I came in last. And my uncle ended up winning. And it was so hard for me to praise him within my crisis. To be like, good job, Christopher. Good job, I shot my worst. I've never shot that bad in my entire life. And I, it was hard for me to praise my uncle for winning. We don't like to praise things when we're in a crisis. We don't. Our response is usually negative. It's usually focused on ourself. It's usually focused on trying to get revenge. Next time I'm going to get him. But in all serious though, when we're really going through a crisis, we tend to focus on ourselves. We don't focus on the character of God. We don't. That's not our natural inclination. That's because of our sin. But, but, we can be always joyful within the crisis, the present crisis and the eternal crisis because of Christ, because of who he is, because of what he has done. And our response has to be always, always to turn back to him day in and day out, fixating our whole selves upon who he is because he's worthy. God's character should always cause you to place God in your life where he should always be, and that is God above the heavens and his glory over all the earth, especially when you reflect on what God has done for you on the cross and the chasm that our sin has created. I mean, you take a minute, a minute and reflect upon the cosmic chasm that our sin broke between our relationship with the Lord, and yet you realize how far Jesus went for you. Man, your automatic response when you think upon those things and when you submit yourself to the word of God, man, it has to be praise. It has to be praise. Because you're literally taking God himself and exalting him where he is always. Because the king of kings gave his life for you. And at the apex of atonement on Calvary, Christ, God, died for your and I's sin so that we could take refuge within the Savior to praise him because he's deserving and just and know that his love is forever faithful and it's always steadfast. It's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing. Man, in all seasons, no matter where we are at, we can repeat just like David did. God, be exalted above the heavens. And let your glory be over all the earth. So in conclusion, exalt God within the crisis. 
Exalt God within the crisis by remembering that he is your refuge and savior, that he is deserving and just, and that he is faithful and his love is steadfast. Start by exalting the work done for you on the cross. If you don't know where to go or how to start or what to do, go right to Jesus. That's where you start, acknowledging that you are a sinner, that you are in need of a savior, and that savior was given for you. Find refuge in him. Rest within the it is finished. He is deserving and just. Remember that he is deserving and just. That we serve a God who is to be exalted and look at him in the same speechless law that David does. I think a good way to do this, a practical way for us to do this is Matt and Jill are going to come up. Um, I think a practical way for us to do this is to do what we're doing as a church, to submit ourselves under the authority of the ever-present, ever-living word of God and memorize it. We have, uh, we're going through as a church Psalm 119, and if there's about 22 or 23 sections within this psalm where we as a church are trying to pray through. Um, I'd encourage you to get a prayer journal. I love, Jesse hates journaling his prayers. I love journaling my prayers. Uh, because I get to look back and see the faithfulness of God and how he has answered, or maybe not answered, specific ones. And I'd highly encourage you to get that prayer journal. Get into Psalm 119 this summer. Start digging into it um, and submitting to the God who is your refuge and who is deserving to be praised. And lastly, exalt God within the crisis by remembering that he is faithful and his love is steadfast. God's character <clears throat> should always cause us, always cause us to put him in his rightful place, always. And I'm so thankful that it is by his love and his faithfulness that he has sent his son to die in our place, to take our sin so that we can praise him just like David did. That no matter where we're in this life, no matter what we're going through or what will come, we are hidden within the God who never moves. The God who's higher than our situation. The God who is better and is always faithful. And his love is always steadfast. I was reading a book this week. <clears throat> Jer uh, Jeremy Rhine quotes in his Nine Marks book. Our spiritual inability should drive us to call out for God's power. To bring growth. And I would, I would want nothing more as a church, as a church body, to realize that we can't do it. But God can. And that if we want to see growth within this church, if we want to see growth within Milwaukee, if we want to see lives to be saved, it's not going to be by our own power. It's going to be by the God who is exalted above the heavens. And we got to cry out to the God most high. So I pray that this summer wouldn't be an off season, but I pray that it would be an on season, that we take the field with our pads and our cleats ready to go. And we do that by crying out, by prayer. It's gonna be a great summer and I'm excited to see what God is going to do because he is God above the heavens and his glory will be over all the earth. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that you are the God exalted, that you are above the heavens, and you came down to be with us, to die in our place. Why? Why, Lord? Because you love. Because you loved us enough to send your only son to die in our place. And I pray, Lord, that as we reflect upon the Psalms in Psalm 57, that no matter where we in this life, where we are in this life or what happens God we can know that our eternal refuge and salvation is within you alone that the eternal crisis have been, has been averted Lord because of you for those who hide within your wings who, are, who find shelter within you Jesus Lord we can praise we can cry out to the God most high who was and is and May we shout together continually this morning, God be exalted.